So welcome everybody. Um, welcome to our launch event for our Art and Sporting Heritage Month. This is the first time um, we've been uh, able to do this um, and our focus um, this month or this year is going to be on visual art. We're really thrilled to be able to bring these um, connections together through heritage and art in the field of sport. There's so many links between all of our collections, whether you're a, an individual, an organisation or a, an artist yourself. And we're really pleased to bring together um, a really great panel. And I hope that um, there'll be lots of questions and um, conversation flowing. Um, I thought I'd just um, do a little bit of housekeeping before we start. For those of you who I've not met before, my name's Fran Stovold and I'm the Workforce Development Lead for Sporting Heritage. So I run our webinar programme, um, our networks and the conference. Um, Thank you for everybody um, for turning your video off. You obviously read my messages that I sent through in advance. I hope this will make it easier for you to see who's on our panel today. Um, you can always set your Zoom up so that you've just got speaker view um, on the screen as well. So you, then it will swap in between the speakers as we go through. A few technical bits and pieces. Um, if for any reason your tech fails as we go through the session, um, you can just log back in and I will keep an eye on the waiting room and um, let you back into the session. If for any reason our tech fails and the session goes down, um, I will endeavour to email everybody and let you know whether we can get up and running again within our time frame or whether we need to reschedule. We are recording the session, so if you want to keep your cameras off um, throughout, it's whatever's most comfortable with you. Um, because we're all in the same room and it's quite a busy room today, which is great to see so many people here. Um, if you have questions as we're going through the session, if you want to put them in the chat and we will pick them up as we go along, um, if we can. If not, we've put some time aside after the panel discussion to have a question and answer session. And at that point, we can all turn our cameras on if you're comfortable to do that. Any queries, just pop them in the chat and we will um, answer them as we go along. Um, I thought I'd just give everybody an overview before I hand over to our, our panel discussion of what we've got going on this month. It's a really packed month. We're, we're really thrilled to be able to bring this to you. So we will be spending the month sharing collections and showcasing artists that bring together sport and art. Um, and we would really um, invite you to take part in this as well on our social media platforms. Um, if you tag us in with the hashtag sport and art, and I'll put all the details in the chat. Um, you're welcome to share your collections, artists that you're inspired by, um, or if you are a practicing artist yourself, individual artworks, and just inspiration in general around this field. Um, I'll put the link in to our website where all the details are, and you'll see we've got a calendar of themes that we are proposing for our sporting, um, Sport and Art Month on social media. So um, you're more than welcome to time with those or, or go your own way. You'll see that there's, a, there's a, a, something different for every day. Um, in addition to the social media um, presence, we have Twitter hours going on throughout the month. Um, we've got three planned at the moment with Jess Hartshorn, who is our in-house artist um, with Sporting Heritage. I'm sure some of you will be familiar with her work over the last couple of years. Um, Graham Bandera and also Martin Routledge later in the month. We also have an in conversation with Roel Bradstock, <coughs> who is uh, also known as the Olympic Picasso, as a former Olympic athlete representing both the UK and uh, uh, the USA as a javelin thrower. He is uh, now retired as an athlete and now um, is an artist, practicing artist, uh, making work um, inspired by the Olympics. So you can see an in conversation piece with him and our education lead Derek People. We also have a blog with Gail who is with us today so you'll find out a bit more about Gail's work today but if you want to know more there's a, a blog on our website um, about her work. Um, we have a suite of teaching resources put together by our education lead Derek that are linked to both the Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 3 national curriculum. There's a teach guide and a presentation there um, if they would be useful for you. We also have a podcast, um, which is uh, entitled Talking Sport and Art with Liam Stokes Massey, who's also known as the pencil craftsman. And he started off drawing footballers and now has been really inspired. His work's really beautiful. So you're definitely worth um, going and having a listen of his conversation with our podcast lead, uh, Russell. Um, and then finally, coming for half term, so it's a coming soon, um, Jess Hartshorn, our illustrator, um, is putting together a spot the difference, um, uh, a digital online spot the difference. So there's there's a whole raft of things um, to get involved with. 
so I think that's all I need to say at this point. Um, what I would like to do is introduce our chair for our panel discussion today. So I'd like to hand over to Imogen Given from National Gallery Scotland. Imogen, over to you. Thanks, Fran. Gosh, I think you've whetted our appetite there. What a wonderful menu of things happening throughout February. But one thing, I'm only sorry that it's happening in the shortest month of the year. Um, anyway, look forward to, to seeing what, what comes up and out during the month. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for joining us today. Um, and thanks for inviting me to chair the panel discussion. Um, I'm gonna introduce briefly the panel before we um, hear about their practice and the collections they look after. Um, so today we're joined by Sally Bills from the British Sporting Art Trust, artist Gail Rogers, and two colleagues from the National Football Museum, curator Belinda Scarlett, and documentation and collections freelancer and practicing artist Tilly Johnston. Welcome to all of you. Really um, excited to hear what you're going to share with us today. So um, we're each going to further introduce ourselves and share with you the way that we're involved in sport and art, either through our collections or practice, and hopefully um, whet your appetite for the month ahead. So I'm going to tee off. I'm going to share my screen. There we go. Is that, all, is that all okay? You can see that? Great. Okay. So um, my name's Imogen, as Fran says. I'm Deputy Director and Chief Curator of Portraiture at the National Galleries of Scotland. I'm based at the Scottish National Portrait Gallery. Um, I became involved in sporting heritage and most particularly sport and art when I curated an exhibition at the National Galleries of Scotland called Playing for Scotland, The Making of Modern Sport, which ran at the Portrait Gallery in Edinburgh from 2011 to 2017. I'm also a trustee for the Hockey Museum um, and have an Instagram account called Sport in Art, which delivers a daily dose of exactly that. And I'm very much looking forward to following along with the themed calendar throughout the month. So to the National Galleries of Scotland collection, um, the collection is displayed across three sites in Edinburgh, the Scottish National Gallery, the Scottish National Portrait Gallery, and the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art. Hence, we have a rich and varied collections on a sporting theme dating from the 17th century to the 21st centuries. At the last count, I think the collection included, bear in mind the whole collection is probably around 120,000 items, not far short of a thousand sporting related artworks. Um, I've crammed in a selection of artworks on this first slide to give you an idea of the range of sports related artworks in the collection. So I'm going to pick a few out here. Um, starting on the top row on the left, far left, we have the golfers, or to give its full title, and it is a full title, a grand match played over the links of St Andrews on the day of the annual meeting of the Royal and Ancient Golf Club. Um, and it's by the Scottish artist Charles Lees, painted in 1847. Um, as part of our remit as a national organisation, we loan artworks and this artwork actually, since we acquired it in 2002. So over the last 20 years, it's been on loan to the National Horse Racing Museum. It's been on loan regularly to the RNA World Golf Museum. And it's even travelled as far afield as America as part of our Art of Golf touring exhibition. Still on the top row, second from the right, we have a portrait study of Maggie McKelleny, a former Paralympic swimmer. Um, this is a portrait study by John Lesaw, um, and he made it um, in preparation for his National Portrait Gallery London Commission, the painting Six British Paralympic Athletes, which is set in the Sydney Olympic Stadium during the celebrations on the last night of the 2000 Paralympics. Moving to the middle of the slide, uh, the football painting, um, this is by Scottish artist Peter Howson, painted in 1987, and it's called Just Another Bloody Saturday. I wanted to squeeze a photograph in here, um, as we have colleagues joining us from the National Football Museum. So the photograph next to the Howson painting is a photograph of a ladies football match taking place in Edinburgh in the 1930s, and it's part of the McKinnon collection of photographs, which is a recent joint acquisition between the National Galleries and the National Library of Scotland. Um, moving to the bottom row, bottom left, topical for the Winter Olympics about to start, we have a painting called The Curlers 
by George Harvey, dating from the 1830s. If you look very closely, you can see the um, cute detail of the dog running along the ice, watching the stone move across the ice. Next to the curling painting, we have a portrait of the champion cyclist of Great Britain in the 1870s, Eon Keith Faulkner, who was a cyclist and then became a missionary. And then a more modern take on the um, art of cycling, a triple portrait of Sir Chris Hoy by the Scottish artist Jennifer McRae. So as part of our programme, we're actively acquiring sporting related artworks and commissioning sported related artworks. The portrait of Chris Hoy was a commission following the 2008 Beijing Games. So I'm going to touch upon one portrait which doesn't feature in this slide and talk to you in a little bit more detail. Um, and this seemingly boardroom-like portrait, which I think for many will arouse more interest when I reveal the name of the sitter, Eric Liddell, Olympic athlete and missionary. Little famously didn't run in his favoured event, the 100 metres at the Paris Olympics in 1924, as the heats were on a Sunday, although he went on to win the gold medal in the 400 metres, as we all know, as we, we saw in the film Chariots of Fire. The portrait and the accompanying sketch, both by Eileen Soper, who became well known as a wildlife artist and is perhaps best known today as an illustrator for Enid Blyton. And this is the only known existing painted portrait of Liddell, who died from a brain tumour at the age of 43, whilst interned during his time as a missionary in China. Soper was only 20 when she painted this portrait, and she depicts Liddell not as an athlete or rugby player, Liddell won seven caps for Scotland in the early 1920s, but suited with a hint of a smile around the mouth and eyes looking up from the folded letter he holds directly and intensely engaging with us. It was painted in 1925, the year after his triumph in the 400 metres, so it seems initially an unobvious choice for him to be depicted in a three-piece suit rather than his um, athletics gear. Um, Little was still competing post Paris. 1925 was the year of his last appearance on the track on British soil at Hampden Park in the summer of that year before he travelled to China to pursue missionary work. Um, and you can see, as I said, Sofa's illustrative style in the sketch, pencil sketch on the right, also in the NGS collection. And I think for me, these depictions of Liddell radiate as a result of having read about the story of the relationship between the artist and the sitter in the biography of Liddell by Duncan Hamilton. Soper was a family friend of the Liddells. During the time he sat for this portrait, they took walks together in the countryside. Soper wrote a poem entitled 2EL, describing how they walked in the hills and how he etched their initials in a tree trunk with a key. Any thoughts of romance were ended when Liddell left for China later that year. And Soper kept this portrait at her home. She never exhibited it. The painting was found in her sitting room on her easel when she died in 1990. Their names forever linked in her inscription at the bottom left-hand corner of the painted portrait, complete with middle initials for Eileen Alice Soper and Eric Henry Liddell. We acquired this portrait in 1995 as a result of a tip off from a gallery visitor who'd seen the portrait up for sale in a London um, sale room. And our then director remarked, we had despaired of ever getting a likeness of Eric Liddell. So there is much rejoicing here. And the portrait was unveiled later in the year on the 71st anniversary of Liddell's record-breaking run in Paris by the then European 400 meter champion, Scottish athlete, Melanie Neef, in the presence of Liddell's family. I think this portrait is arguably more redolent of Liddell than if he'd been depicted by Soper as an athlete. It only came to light around 70 years after his Olympic victory, and we're all familiar with the photographs of Liddell in his running vest and in his civilian attire, but I think because this depiction was unknown until the 1990s, once found, it shone a new light on Liddell, the athlete and man, adding to his story and further extending his legacy. And besides, the power of portraiture from life 
means that we see little directly through the eyes of someone who undoubtedly would have heard a first-hand account of his experience at the 1924 Olympics. So thank you for indulging me with that introduction um, on one of my favourite topics. I'm now going to pass the baton to Sally, who's going to share with us um, some images from the British Sporting Art Collection. So I'm going to stop sharing and mute myself. Hello, uh, I'm Sally Bills. I work for the British Sporting Art Trust in uh, Newmarket. We're a membership organisation. Uh, we were established quite a long time ago in 1977 as a request from the Tate. Um, they were wanting to, a representative collection of sporting art uh, and we joined as a way of fundraising for their collection and in fact uh, we, a large collection came through us to the Tate. Uh, uh, recently though we, we created our own galleries in Newmarket and we've just been through a large multi-million pound redevelopment in Newmarket and opened as part of the National Horse Racing Museum uh, in the palace of the remnants of the palace of Charles II, which is particularly resonant because what became known as the sporting art genre actually started to flourish after the restoration and the re-establishment of sport, particularly horse racing. And many of the people coming back from Holland and the re-establishment of country houses were looking for art to display on their walls and sporting art developed as a genre from that point. Um, we have a representative collection. Our strengths is 18th and 19th century sporting art, but we've recently collected 40 photographs by the sports photographer uh, from the Times, Chris Smith, uh, which has a wide variety of sports included in it. We support the Fred Pet Packard Galleries of Sporting Art here at Newmarket, uh, uh, which is, displays our collection, but a lot of the collections are loans. We have a fruitful relationship with the Tate Gallery because of our foundation, so that's still very much uh, one of our partners. And as Imogen says, we've lent quite a few works from Scottish National Collection, especially on our founding display. Uh, which the golfers that she showed came to Newmarket. I've chosen this picture, which is a Tate picture. As I said, we have a very close relationship with Tate. I think we've got 17 pictures on display from them at the moment. I've chosen it because it resonates with me. It, I, I encourage you to come to Newmarket because we've got a wide variety. And the reason it resonates with me is because it sums up a lot of what sporting art is. Uh, and what it, it uh, puts across. This is a moment where a group of gentlemen, and it could be different sport, it could be any sport, it could be a modern sport, it's that moment just before they are going to partake of the day's activities. They're relaxed and they're waiting for the sports to begin. And it shows the companionship of sport. It's by Ren Eagle, it's called the Carrow Hunt, Carrow Abbey Hunt. It also shows the context in which sporting art was hung at that time. You can see the sporting prints in the background and all the paraphernalia of sports. And it also shows this gentleman here who's called Jim Meads. He was a celebrity of, of his day. He, his pursuits were, his activities were reported about in the sporting magazines of the day. Um, so within his time, he was well known within the hunting community. It also shows the person who, in the center here, which is James Morris, who commissioned the picture. Uh, it shows a little bit about who was commissioning. It's a group of sort of gentlemen worthies of Norwich. We've got brewers, we've got manufacturers, and we've got two mayors here. There was two versions made, one by this commission for this gentleman for his war, and one that was hung and kept within the uh, ownership of the hunt for many years. So it shows that context of who was commissioning. So it was a, a group or an organization. So 
and that shows a lot of the foundations of our current collections uh, within this country. So we've got places like Lords, who were commissioned, who've collected rugby pictures for their club walls, um, and we've got places like Twickenham, and I suspect a little bit like a horse racing museum. They were collected as a memorial for their activities. It also shows a little, tells a little bit about the painters of the time. There was definitely pink painters who were called sporting artists, especially in the 18th and 19th century. And Ren Eagle, who painted this picture, was one of those. But it shows he had to be adapt to the current fashions of the time. So it's chosen to represent them very much in the style of the period, which you can see is a conversation piece. And you can see sort of resonation, it resonates with things like Gainsborough and Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. And also this, the sporting artist had to be very adaptable. He had to be not only a portrait painter, he had to know the sport, he had to know the details of the paraphernalia around it. It had to be accurately portrayed. And if an animal was involved, which in the 18th and 19th century, animals were very much involved with sport, the individual animals would have to be recognizable and they would have to be horse, if it was a horse painting, it would have to be a, an accurate depiction of a horse and recognizable as an individual horse. And the same in the case of these hounds who were all known by their name and by their characteristics, by the people within the hunt. So, they would have to be recognizable as individual animals. So that's a little bit about why I've chosen it. It sort of sums up so many of the things that sporting art is about. It's about the moment, it's about the celebrity, it's about the enjoyment of the sport, and it's about a depiction of an actual day. And with that, I'll pass over to Gay. <laughs> Thank you. Gail, sorry. I'm just going to share my screen for you. Thanks, Ali. Um, I just want to um, give a trigger warning before I start, because I will be talking about um, bereavement and grief. And if this is something that you weren't expecting and you didn't want to listen to, just um, mute me for five or six six minutes. So uh, what times kick off stories of love and loss inspired by legendary England and Manchester United footballer Duncan Edwards. Um, I'm going to be presenting some images from my work in progress, um, which is a graphic novel that's based on my PhD research, which considered the commemoration of the 1958 Munich air disaster and specifically my ancestor, Duncan Edwards, who died as a result of the injuries um, he was in the crash. So just bear with me. Let me go back again. So this is uh, one of the large scale drawings. I've got three drawings to, to show you. This is a large scale drawing. Um, the top that goes across horizontally is from a football chant about um, the, the crash. It's not all good in, the, in memories. I'd love it to be sentimental. Horrific chants about uh, the Munich air disaster. Um, and this one starts, who's that dying on the runway? Who's that dying in the snow? It's Matt Busby and his boys making all the rude word noise because they can't get their airplane to go. So this is a hand-drawn um, series of um, panels. The footballers, the football fans rather, are shown as leatherheads. Uh, they're le leather football um, because that's what they do. They stretch their arms out and pretend to be crashing planes. I wanted to show the different um, sides of the same story. So I took the front two pages are the same for both of the zines, the, the image going across the top, the images going down. Uh, this is a graphite drawing of the crashed plane, which is inspired by the newspaper images at the time. And this 
is the diversity. So the one on the left is the chant that opens in a concertina way. So you have to stretch out your arms like the um, rival fans do. Uh, the other drops down into you. So it's a bit more awkward, it's a bit more personal, comes down, but they both have the same front because they're both at the same event. And that's just an image showing the concertina. That's a close up to show you that it's, you know, it's heavily worked in uh, um, pencil. Front. The other side, which drops down, is, is what I call the factual side. The images are taken from the actual crash site. Um, it says when and where the crash happened. Uh, and this is the smoke. The wreckage was still burning a few days later. Uh, and I've kind of tried to get all the images on together. I've faded out the words on the factual one, but they actually say that, you know, uh, 23 people were dead or died away at that specific time, four minutes past three. Um, and another big part of my work is uh, reinterpreting people's memories. Um, this is Roy Cavanagh's uh, memory. He's, uh, these are large scale charcoal drawings on brown paper. So they're about a meter by a meter and a half. So Roy, at 10 years old, was walking home through Manchester um, when he saw the bill. Um, and the fantastic thing about uh, uh, Roy's memory is at 10 years old, uh, he was devastated by the, the, the loss of these players, who he, a lot of them he lived near to. And he lived near to Eddie Coleman's house, which was number nine, Archie Street. And um, the following day, he went through his school desk and at lunchtime, he took uh, to the family's front door all the mementos he had of Eddie and passed them over. He doesn't know why he did it, he did. Uh, and then he goes on to say how devastated he was, so devastated that he couldn't actually watch them play until the following September. So these are just large panels that I'll be dropping and moving his actual text in. And I also sample his um, handwriting and then I create a font around his individual handwriting. So it really is people's personal stories. The final one is digital uh, drawing. And this is um, of walking to the Duncan statue. He's got a huge uh, a, a statue of him in Dudley Town Centre. Um, and it's just on the 6th of February, 1958, the plane crashed, but it took another two weeks uh, uh, for him to die. Um, things that have come to me, and I sometimes think he'd probably still be here if it weren't for football. So, um, and then that's a, a drawing of me arriving at the, the, the statue, taking him as flowers. I'm just going to end with a, a photograph. The, the period that I'm looking at in the 1950s, not many people had cameras. This is a picture of my mom at 14 years old. She grew up with Duncan. She knew Duncan. He was about three years older than her. It's her memories that have inspired the, not only my PhD, but this work that I'm doing now. And it's, uh, you know, it's a privilege to be able to create images that can potentially bring to life um, and help people connect to stories that aren't any sort of visuals. So that's me. Um, I'll now pass on to Linda. I'll stop sharing. There you go. Thanks, Gail. Hi, my name is Belinda Scarlett. I'm curator at the National Football Museum. I'll be talking a little bit about the types of material that we've got in the National Football Museum collection. Um, I will just share my screen. Okay, so this is a, a variety of the type of material we have in the National Football Museum collection. I think some people are quite surprised that there is a significant amount of art in the National Football Museum collection, which is in Manchester for people who haven't visited. Um, my specialism within the collection is actually in women's football. So almost without realizing it, I've managed to select almost purely examples of art either of women or created by women. 
Um, much of our collection was based on material collected by a private collector that was actually owned by FIFA um, and was purchased by the National Football Museum many years ago with a heritage lottery grant. And the art on the on the top left is is one of the first pieces of art that was entered into the National Football Museum collection through the FIFA collection. Um, and it's by a relatively famous um, surrealist artist, Ithil Kolkuan, I think that's how you pronounce her name, who actually produced this for a football association competition, art competition in 1953. Um, it's called the Game of the Year. Um, it's one of my favourite pieces in the collection. And I think it's unusual in many ways, not only because it was produced by a woman, but also because it was produced for this competition in 1953. It has been on display at the museum as well, although it's not currently on display at the moment. The second piece, I won't talk too much about it now just because it's the one that I'd like to highlight, but it's actually a, a relatively recent acquisition and shows how some of the things that we depict through sporting art are changing through um, what work gets commissioned, who produces it, and what's collected by museums like the Football Museum. I've tried to include examples of um, what we consider to be um, sporting art at the National Football Museum, and we focus quite a lot on art and design. So I've included a football kit, um, which was actually produced last year by a grassroots women's football team. Um, and they produced this, they have graphic designers on their team. So it was produced by a graphic designer, but she was inspired by photographs and history from the women's game. So it includes a quote from a football player in the 1920s. Um, and it, I think it just shows how people that are producing sporting art now are very much inspired by the, the history and the past of, of football and other sports. I've included an image of two artworks that are on display at the museum. Um, one of our most famous and probably most popular artworks is the one by Michael Brown of Eric Cantona. So this um, was painted in 1997 and depicts the resurrection of Eric Cantona following his nine month ban from football. Um, he kung fu kicked a football fan um, he's very much adored by Manchester United football fans, or many of them, and it's definitely one of the most popular pieces on display at the National Football Museum. And next to that is a statue of Lily Parr, which was um, collected in 2019, so it's a relatively new acquisition, um, and it's the first statue of a female footballer to be produced in the UK. Lily Parr played football predominantly in the 1920s and 1930s, so was subject to the Football Association's ban on the women's game. And the reason I, I like this image in particular of the galleries is to show those two pieces of artwork side by side. So it very much reflects the 50% representation pledge that the National Football Museum has in place um, to try and improve representation of women in football. The two final pieces, one is a photograph. So we have a relatively large collection of photography at the National Football Museum. The largest is probably um, by a photographer called Stuart Roy Clark, who took a lot of photographs of football grounds following um, the Hillsborough disaster and the changes to football stadiums and fandom as a result of that. But more recently, we acquired this um, photograph of Enia Luco, who uh, played for England and Chelsea um, by a, ph a photographer called Jane Stockdale. And the reason I've chosen this is, again, to show the sort of alternative ways that this sort of photography has been commissioned. There's this is actually commissioned by a football zine called Season. Um, and it's in some of those places where you find quite a lot of very interesting and um, contemporary photography of, of sports people are now being taken. And finally, there is a, a programme on the far right, which was produced by Norwich City um, in 2020, I believe, uh, which is actually one of the first matches post the first lockdown and represents um, what was going on in society at the time. So it was around the time of the Black Lives Matter protests. And again, just shows how sporting art and things like football programmes as sporting art can really show um, what's going on in wider society and I think they're really important for that reason. So just to focus in a little bit more detail on Band, which is the name of this painting um, by Jill Eilif, this was purchased through a Collecting Cultures grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund um, and without those sort of uh, grant funding organisations the National Football Museum would really struggle to purchase art so it was bought through that, um, that grant funding so it was a very important acquisition and the reason I've chosen this is um, 
partly because I just I love it as a, as a piece of art, but also because of the reasons Jill chose to paint it. So sport is not something that she paints very often, um, but she is interested in memory and she's interested in hidden histories and she's interested in shared experiences. And she started following some grassroots women's football teams in her area before she painted this. And um, she got almost obsessed with the concept of what, what is hidden history, what's banned and why it's banned. And obviously women's football ha had restrictions in 1921, but there's still issues around what women wear when they play football, including women who choose to wear a hijab when they play football. So it's a very contemporary, relevant subject. And she wanted to show um, players that looked, um, as she said, strong, enthusiastic and unhindered. And I think that's what she's managed to achieve in this painting. And this went on display in a, um, a large scale exhibition that we put on display, I think in 2018, um, called Football is Art. And this is one of our centerpiece paintings. Um, I'll now hand over to Tilly, who also works at the National Football Museum with me. I'll just stop sharing. Hello, I will share my screen. Hi, um, it's been wonderful hearing everyone else, everyone's different perceptions and pieces of artwork. I um, just wanted to say that before I start. Um, so I'm Tilly, I'm from the National Football Museum. I'm a documentation and collections freelancer and practicing artist. Um, I studied at Manchester at Metropolitan and then went on and did a traineeship with the British Museum Learning Programme and I was on placement at the Football Museum. Um, before I started, I was not <laughs> interested in football at all. So I think that drove me to really look at the parts of the collection that I was interested in, which was um, the artistic and creative side of the game and it, all the affirmia that's around the game. Um, so this is what I've chosen to share today, and I'll be mainly talking about the David Hockney um, print, which is the large print on the top left hand side of the page. But around that, I just wanted to show some of the fanzines that are created as well, because to me, I see a link in its presentation and production and accessibility. Um, they are all easily accessible for the public. The, the print was sold for like 18 pence in the local newspaper and fanzines are sold for like 40, 50 P. So it's, it's readily available for the fans and it feels like it's um, a form of work for, for the people. And um, so we'll move on to talk about the... Bradford one, just needs to look out how to press next. Ah, there we go. Um, so the Bounce of Bradford was part of a campaign in the late 1980s. And it was a campaign to sort of regenerate Bradford a little bit, um, following the deindustrialization in the 70s and 80s of the town and many sort of industrial towns, um, which then sort of propagated a rise in unemployment. And then there was the Bradford City Stadium fire in 1985, which left quite a, quite a devastating effect on the town and the community and the football team. Um, so this was produced by Hockney in 1987. Um, and it drove forward this campaign to rebuild and give something new to the community. And it was given directly to the community as well through its production and accessibility. So Hockney created these plates, which were, it was a form of lithograph. And each colour you'll see on the picture will be made from a different plate. So he would have created maybe four or five plates and passed them on to the Telegraph and Argus newspaper, which is the local newspaper in Bradford. 
where they printed the artworks. Um, so that in itself is quite a, a unique style of engagement with the community and it's given them a sense of ownership over this like David Hockney original print as well um, which I think reflects football and reflects the game and it's working class roots it's a very accessible game and fans have a sense of ownership over their team just you can see from like the words they use the phrases like what's your team my team's this and then from that comes a judgment or pride or shame or stuff like that so it's a great embodiment of football and I think through the zines zines I've been saying that wrong for my life zines that um reflects this as well so yeah this is um this is a piece that I wanted to share with you and yeah I'm not sure who to pass back to, but I think it's probably Imogen. Thanks, Tilly. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm quite um, bowled over by all of those examples that you've given. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, please um, uh, keep putting questions in the chat and Fran and myself will keep an eye on those and um, we will air all of them, hopefully. We've got about 45 minutes left. So I think let's go into the, the panel discussion now. Um, and I think we're gonna sort of discuss what sport and art means to all of us on the panel. Um, I think for me, really, I think and we've seen just now with all of those examples, sport and art, infinite possibilities there um, when they're both brought together. We all engage and experience sport in a different way. We all engage and experience art in a different way. So, you know, right from the very beginning, there's so many possibilities and options there. Um, and if you think about some of the terms we've been using this morning, sport and art, sport in art, art of sport, sporting art. So the only conclusion I can reach is sport is art. Um, and perhaps sometimes art can be sport. Um, Tilly, you made me think with the Hockney print of um, Martina Navratilova's collaboration with Slovak artist, I get the name right, Jurak Kralik, where she worked with him and she loaded up many, many tennis balls with paint and served them, hit them onto a canvas. So I suppose that's another example of art and sport, sport in art, art becoming sport in a way. Um, so let's try and discuss that question. What does sport and art mean to you? And I'm going to come to the speakers in the order in which we've, we've met them this morning. So Sally, I'll come to you first. I'll start by saying thank you for Tilly because uh, I'm, I'm sort of a Yorkshire lass and we have that at home. <laughs> we took it out of the Telegraph and Argos and kept it. And we were actually discussing it, uh, my husband and I recently, how Hockney had done that and how well, we were actually talking about its worth, actually. But there you go. But that's beside the point. But it was something that really resonated with us. So I thank you for sharing that. It, it, it took me back 20 odd years. Um, to me, I, I think Sport is so much part of our culture and is so much part of what everybody enjoys. And it's not surprising that it manifests itself in art in so many wonderful, rich and a variety of ways. And it's done that almost since the beginning. But it, it's, it, the art it reflects in so many ways and some of the things that we've touched upon. And I tend to look at it, uh, at the Sporting Art Trust more as a historical thing uh, rather than as a current thing just by the nature of our collection but it tells you so much about society it tells you so much about women's place in society men's place in society sport in society how sport has been defined in different ways a lot of uh, some of our collection dance was considered a sport and that's changed so some of the sports that we cover like countryside pursuits were so important in the 18th century and that has moved on so much and we've gone through team sports to participation and all those different types of sport is reflected differently in in art and each generation has its own sports each generation has its own art styles and all those are reflected so you you've got the 
Stubbs in the 18th century, the original sporting artists who were fairly naive, going up to the general practitioners today. So you, you, if you name an artist like Banksy, he will use football as a motive in his art. Maggie Hamlin has just done a wonderful portrait of Tim Hemman. And Grayson Perry, who's probably the most known about because of what he's done uh, during lockdown, he used Derby Day as a motif a few years ago. So every generation, uh, every art style reflects sport and sport reflects art. So I will leave it at that. So I'm passionate about it. I think it's, it's such a wonderful broad subject. Thanks, Sally. I can feel your passion coming through the screen. That's wonderful to see. Thank you. Um, Gail. Yeah, I think for me, it, um, uh, it enhances the storytelling. Um, it makes you look at an event or a particular person in a different way. It starts, um, uh, it, it's, it takes you on a different journey um, and also helps you to connect to people people who are not particularly interested in sport they'll come and have they'll walk over and they'll have a look at this picture and and and, and they don't really know that it's about sport they don't really know it's a uh, cluster sport in art or art in sport um but they're engaged straight away so i think that's quite powerful and it's the universal language of art as well um, visual art particularly that um even if there's language that you don't understand or slogans, and um, you can still you can still sort of work out what's happening. I'm still really really optimistic that at some point there will be some cave painting art and people are playing some sort of football game, or um, you, you know that's that 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 would be the best outcome for me because I do feel that it runs through everything. Thanks, Gail. I know myself when I'm trying to choose my images for the sport in, um, in art Instagram account, when I come across a famous artist who might only have painted one sports related painting in their career, you know, that sort of is a big thrill because it, it just proves the point, it proves what you've just said. Um, Belinda, come to you next. I think for me, it's similar to what Tilly said early, earlier, sporting art is a more accessible form of art often, um, or at least it has the potential to be, um, because it can cover such a wide range of different types of art and design, I think. And people who, or visitors who may not necessarily engage with art regularly or visit art galleries, might experience art through sport. So it opens up a whole new uh, potential audience. For me, that's what's special and significant about sporting art and just it's huge the huge variety as well I think of types of art and the people who create it um, because of the sport is so accessible it opens up a whole new world of potential artists and people to appreciate it. Thanks Belinda I know at the Scottish National Portrait Gallery um, we've been we've been actually trying to gather more and more feedback since we've reopened after the first lockdown and consistently our audiences are saying we want to see more portraits of um, Scottish sports stars we want to see more images which reflect the sporting heritage of Scotland and um, throughout the ages so um, again chimes in with your point about new audiences and attracting new audiences um, Tilly. Hello. Um, so, yeah, I think um, I think sport and art is wonderful in that it it has so many unique personalities related to that sport, and it it embodies such personality and reflection of the culture and the emotion and the. Um, the structure as well of where it is like with the footballing collection I absolutely love seeing the the personality and the culture in each scene and how each one is so unique and there's so much engagement and emotion from people creating and producing these works of art um 
from I don't know if they're paid to create a zine or if there's any sort of like monetary like goals there but I imagine that a lot of the time it's created for free or if it's created it's it's not going to be like for monetary purposes um and I imagine one of the biggest motivations is just to share that enjoyment and love and passion for it which I think is wonderful that um the art behind sport is really rooted in um the emotional experience of it which can be so like engaging and so intense for lots of people thanks Tilly it it, it really does spill over doesn't it um Belinda I was really pleased to see you highlight the gold diggers fc artwork it's fantastic um and I, I've ordered a couple of shirts so um, yeah they are beautiful things yeah. <laughs> they're very lucky because they have artists and graphic designers that play on their team so when you have a combination <laughs> of history and art and design together and just the absolute passion and love within the team itself it really comes through in that kit I think it's an amazing thing and referring back to the 1921 band exactly as well, you know, yeah it's brilliant that legacy bringing a new audience into the, mm -hmm. to the history of women in football um fran if you wanted to put that in the chat the team that have made and collaborated with the national football museum they're called gold diggers fc so you should be able to find the link they've got a big um pdf i think which which will uh, uh give more details on those designs um okay i am going to go to the chat now so we have a question from helen this is an interesting one does the amount of art focused upon a particular sport correlate with participation stroke popularity levels so i'm, I'm going to see who's reaching for the unmute button i think i can see sally reaching for the unmute button <laughs> I, I don't think it does. Uh, we we are very imbalanced towards certain sports. We we have a, a lot of horse racing sports, which is a lot of horse portraits within our collection, which is not surprising being in Newmarket. Uh, but that relates to patronage and I think who commissions art. And I think the interesting discussion which has been brought out is um, the popularization of sports that's happened through teen sport and participation sports has changed the nature of sporting art. So in the 18th and 19th century, you do have popular art through the prints that were hung on uh, walls and the, the cost of those descended and the quality descended so they could be on cottage walls, particularly things like boxing prints. But I think nowadays, there's such a mass audience that it's become more popular art and deck art that is uh, seen um and is less within galleries and less within on the walls and less within the um traditional types of art uh, so poster art is very important kits programs that kind of thing and badges <laughs> so it has changed as sports changed but it's still within mainstream art as well and it still gets uh commissioned there's still commissions for art and the other thing that you have to look at is what stadiums look like and what the experience of going and what art you see when you are going to a team sport and how important that is for the experience. So as a rugby player going to Twickenham, the wonderful statues that you see when you go into Tw Twickenham and is part of the experience. The World Rugby Museum, going there as part of your experience of your day looking into the heritage of your team, seeing those pictures on the wall within the committee rooms, if you go back, is all part of the experience. So it has changed. It's more public, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Sally. And I think to some extent, there's still an enormous amount of material that's untapped at the moment when we're talking about sport in art, you know, including maybe, as Gail said, some of those cave paintings. I mean, I'm sitting here and I've got a big book called Sport Is Art um, by a, a Czech um, author, a big thick book. None of those paintings or artworks I knew about at all. So I think it's also a case of, as we're doing throughout February, mm. is sharing, sharing new works, sharing perhaps um, works of, of sports where we're not familiar, so, so familiar with the artworks that um, celebrate the experience and the engagement with that sport. 
I think going back to the cave painting, I think there is an actual, which I will check, and if I can, I will send on, but I think there is a cave painting of the horse race. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I said, as I said, it, I thought, oh, I'm sure there, there must be. I think what's, it, what's interesting, it's in terms of increasing participation in going to sport, what I can say is there's been a huge increase in participation in commemorative events particularly the Munich air disaster, where there's even more people producing um, memorabilia. There's even more people um, going back and drawing or um, uh, colorizing photographs from, from certain eras. So in terms of participation in commemorative events or, or historical events, and I don't know whether it's the same with others, definitely with the Munich air disaster, there are there's a lot more um, art being produced than 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 there's ever been there's ever been and some of the, the items you've mentioned gail would would fall into sort of must-haves for fans and collectors as well who are sort of already involved in that i mean you know often when you're watching tv commentary of a football match you know they always and rugby matches they mention the program so um, you know, which often contains art as well. Um, Belinda and Tilly, coming to you um, just to see if you have anything to add to, the, to Helen's question of the amount of art focus on a particular sport correlating um, with the participation levels. Um, I'm not sure, Spence. I've only ever worked with football art, so I've never worked in a collection that has other types of um, sport represented. Um, I think you don't necessarily get a lot of fo football art that is produced that's considered fine art. Um, but if you just count a football program as art, then there is a huge quantity of football art through things like programs and badges and kits um, and photography. So in, arguably, because you have so many people producing that type of art and going to football matches, then yet yes, it, 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 there is more football art because football is such a popular sport. It's our national sport, arguably, that every week, every weekend, football programmes are being created that have art in them, are, are, are themselves art. Um, so, so yeah, maybe on that basis, you could say there is more football art than there is any other type of sporting art, but I'm not sure you might... Other people might argue with that. <laughs> Thanks, Belinda. Tilly, anything to, to add on that before we move on to the next question? Um, not particularly, no. I was in sort of in the same boat as Belinda. This is a, the first art collection I've ever worked with, but, and it's in a football museum. So I, I only have that kind of knowledge, and I see art in anything that's like creative and expressionistic and um, so yeah, don't it would be like just a subject you want so much to it if it would yeah, give you anything to move on. Thanks, Tilly. One of my previous postings on Instagram was a, <clears throat> a painting um, of two kittens playing with a shuttlecock. And, and my friend texted me immediately and said, sporting art? And I was like, yeah, it is. <laughs> anyway, so the whole gamut for February for those, for those themed sporting heritage, sport and art um days um okay kevin uh says talking about what is art and relating to belinda's comment around kit designs and badges at what point should sporting design and fashion be considered as art how is such design and accessible street art valued and regarded in museums galleries and archives I'm, Belinda, I might come to you because I'm focusing on the street art element of that. We talked about brief, briefly about that last week. Yeah, so we, we did, we had a, a discussion prior to this and we were talking about the um, Marcus Rashford mural, um, which was graffitied following England's uh, defeat in the final of the Euros. Um, but then the response to that from the community was to, to cover it in... Um, positive messages, flags, um, pictures. Um, and we were arguing, weren't we, that that was, 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 art, was art and that it, it should be collected and it, and it was collected. So um, Manchester Central Library and Archives collected the majority of material from that mural. So it was all very carefully taken down and sent to the archive. And all of the museums and archives in Manchester now working together to 
to conserve that and to potentially display that in the future. So I know the National Football Museum would consider that something that was worthy of display as, as, a, as an artwork, as a, um, a community created artwork. Um, and there's quite a few examples in Manchester and I'm sure it's the case across the country where football players have been depicted in murals or graffiti on, on walls around the city centre. Um, particularly ones which are football players that are working towards a social purpose as well, like Marcus Rashford. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's increasingly a way which sports people are being commemorated is through is through statues, but it's through community art, is people just putting art up on on walls. Um, so for me, that that is equally a football art alongside all, all the other stuff we've been we've been talking about today. Thanks, Belinda. Anyone else want to come in on talking about what is art relating to some of the objects we've we've talked about this morning? I think within the context of Bishop Washing Arts, we, we, we have mainly considered painting and sculpture and works on paper as being art. And I think because we are trying to represent different uh, sports it's very difficult to take on board all the cultural references that are associated with art and because it's such a big thing and I think it's probably a more of a thing that the individual sport museums need to identify than we could possibly encompass because it's so vast and I think that's the difficulty with it when you're as a museum you can define it but actually preserving it is much harder to consider because it's, as I say, it's such a vast subject. Where do you start and where do you finish? Thanks, Sally. Gail or Tilly? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, um, I was looking, because I've been looking at uh, graphic novels and Tilly's spoken about um, fanzines as well, I think um, that seems to be, uh, a growing area, um, people producing graphic novels, uh, things like there's a wonderful graphic novel about Andre the Giant, the uh, who was a professional wrestler. Um, but there, there are things out there. Um, graphic novels are not that big in the UK, but across the continent, across Europe they are a recognised sort of art form and respected art form. So I think we can expect to see, um, particularly through globalisation, things coming in from different cultures like the, the, the photo that Belinda showed us. And I think that's really exciting where things are being mixed up and, they, uh, and that it's okay to go, do you know what, I don't really know what art is. I think it's just everything. Um, and I think it's okay to say that and have those debates and not get hung up um, on it too much. Thanks, Gail. And that, that very much fits into, um, again, what we've touched on already this morning, contemporary collecting around sporting art. Um, those perhaps perceived boundaries are shifting, aren't they? And, um, you know, when, when you're talking about audiences, it has to be accessible, it has to be relevant, and it has to be meaningful. So um, all, to, all to play for there. I've tried to avoid putting in sporting um, sayings this, this morning, but they seem to be coming out. Um, we have another question here. Okay. What, from Scott, what is the difference between performative sport like football and performative art like dance? Is there one? I think Sally's reaching for the unmute button. <laughs> I think it's, um, I, I touched upon it and I, I don't think there's a, 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 an answer really. I, I, I think sport, you just, sport changes with culture and society. You, you know, what's defined as a sport today might not be, you look at what's coming on to the Olympics, you know, uh, you know, and the discussions around what is and isn't a sport. It, it's, it's complex. It's what, society says it's a sport at the end of the day and in the 18th century dancing was probably a sport <laughs> where and whereas darts is on the edge at the moment I think it's still under discussion it, you know it changes it, it depends on society and what they see as it and what people see a sport being I don't think it really matters 
it's, Thanks, it's, it's a moment in <laughs> and then you have the whole sort of leisure industry as well which is a sort of absolute crossover with sports so um anyone else want to come in there about that question i i think most football fans would say that football is is art the game of football i mean playing football and that it's you know it's, it's a beautiful game if you watch certain footballers play then that is a beautiful thing to watch so if you're thinking about emotion and beauty and watching something which creates those feelings then i think a lot of football fans would say that the sport of, of football in itself is 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 art um for, for many many people and i think it's fantastic that people see it like that thanks belinda and that relates to the question from nick can the actual sport itself be considered art football is the beautiful game artistry of particular player skill dynamics of goals scored goals sco dynamics of goals scored and of course we see that in all, all different sports as well as in football um going back to the commentators again and the feelings that it evokes when we watch particular players or teams um going about their professional business i guess or grassroots business as well um anyone else want to come in on the art sport as art um I'll say something. <laughs> um, I think I think it is um, up to the individual, really, of what you what your definition is and what you see art as being. Um, if something sort of inspires emotion in you and inspires a reaction, if it um, engages with you visually, that can be a visually moving art performance of football a visual moving performance of dance or it can be a 2d painting a 3d sculpture i think really um i'd approach this with the idea that art creates an emotional or um, response or reaction from the individual and that can take any forms and i think it's quite a nice link to what you were saying before about how those boundaries of what is art um, and where you see it as sort of are um, diversifying. And it is, it's wonderful having so much um, more room in the world to experience art and where you can experience it. And all of the institutions and in different areas all have such um, a great place. And I think if anything, it's just bringing more people involved. Um, so yeah, I'd say if you want it to be. <laughs> Thanks, Tilly. That's a great answer, because <laughs> I think we all need the, the freedom. You know, we don't need permission to think about sport and art in the same context or, or coming together. And there's that freedom and the emotions that it brings. And I, I think I can't wait. I can't remember which way round I came to sport and art, whether the sport brought brought me to it or the art brought me to it. I think it was a bit of both, actually. And then at some point in my life, I thought, this this is what I'm really interested in. Um, so maybe we should dig a little bit deeper into uh, the question around art in a in, in a sporting context. We've mentioned um, Kevin mentioned fashion actually in his um, question, and that's one thing we probably maybe haven't touched on today. Um, how I suppose the the development of fashion. I'm thinking specifically about the emancipation of women and um, uh, paintings of 1890s uh, female cyclists, um, uh, football art, which sometimes very rarely features women in, in the late 19th century and then moving into that new era in the 20th century. Anyone like to come in? I, I suppose the one thing that uh, I, I was quite interested in, and I haven't come to any conclusions, is uh, how fashion, especially in the 18th century, might have encouraged more women to participate at that time, uh, especially when they were, had the empire line, when they weren't restricted by dress, uh, which came in later with the corset. 
Uh, and there was a flourishing of women participating in the early 18th century. So they were participating in angling, um, bowling, and a, a wide variety of archery particularly. And, and that definitely had an impact uh, within the development of women's sport. And, and then there probably was a contraction in women's sport when the corset came in. It's not really saying what you're saying in Imogen, which is, is fashion art, but it does, fashion does have an impact on women's sport. And it's an interesting point. And also going from side saddle to riding a stride and the impact that had on equestrian sports. That's an interesting area of study as well that could be developed. And, and perhaps because of what women wore to be active mm. in um, uh, uh, traditional days, then that affects how they were represented in yeah. art playing sport, I suppose. If you look yeah. At it like that. yeah, definitely. And There's also, yeah, yeah. And it's also probably um, there is a movement uh, with the uh, Second World War where there was a lot of women working for the remount and that was probably what encouraged uh, them to move away from the side saddle onto riding a stride, which probably had the influence of women moving into wearing more trousers. <laughs> and why women in, in uh, it is an interesting subject, fashion and sport is oh, very wise. And you, it, you can see the progression through the artwork as well. Thanks, Sally. Anyone else want to come in? Um, I, I think there is a strong link between fashion and um, sporting fashion and art, um, not just around the way that women are being portrayed. Um, I, from my experience at the National Football Museum, there are depictions of women playing football from the late 19th century. And what they're wearing is often the subject of conversation. Um, because it's not traditional um, and there's issues around women showing their hair while they're playing football and things like that. So the way that women present while they're playing football has always been a, a you know, controversial thing. And often some of the artwork that we have in the collection on postcards and drawings of women playing football are the, 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 the women are very... Um, feminine looking in their in their appearance overly so and then you see that shift as you get towards the 20th century obviously although not in every case so things like the mascot for the 1971 unofficial Mexico Women's World Cup is almost like a little doll a curvy little doll um so and that's in 1971 and then as you get towards the 1990s the, the depictions of, of women in art and also photography who are playing football are very much just athletic women playing football. Um, so there's definitely something really interesting going on there about who's creating those programmes and pictures and photographs, um, often when it's women who are in charge of the way that they're being depicted. They're depicted as football players and not fe overly feminised little girls in football kits, which they often are, unfortunately, in sort of the late 19th century. Um, so yeah, that's, it's an interesting topic, I think. Thanks, Belinda. We've got two more questions. Um, so I think we're going to take these two questions and then we're going to open up for the chat so that we can actually talk in real time all together. So Kevin poses the following question. Roel Bradstock talks about the connection between sport and art and the idea that maybe for the sports themselves, we should term it as sport and creativity. Do the panel agree this is an accessible and useful way to think about sport and art? I'm gonna give, it, I'm gonna give a very quick answer to that. I think, um, yes, I think is the short answer. Um, just, just sort of digging beneath the surface a little bit. I think it also connects to health and well-being. It connects to art activities that I suppose we as um, colleagues who work in museums and galleries um, share with our audiences. Um, sorry, I'm pausing now because I'm thinking on the spot, but um, anyone else want to come in? 
I think it's oh sorry, Tilly, go on. Um, so I think um using the term creativity, it broadens all those um barriers that you have conceptually about what art is and where you see it. And and I think everyone has those. I have them and I was surprised when I went to the football museum and saw like a, a Lowry painting hanging on the wall and saw those different forms of art and that broadened my perceptions on, on what it is. Um, I, it's, you don't really want to, I don't know, yeah. But I think there's still a place for art as um, a category of objects that are defined as art that are reactive to or have made, been made through sports. But I think definitely with that creativity just allow a lot more people to go in open-minded and see it as something new. Thanks, Tilly. I think it, 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 it's useful to think about sport and creativity because I think one fuels the other in a way, whatever the result or the outcome of that. It might be that you perform better or you perform in a more aesthetic, artistic way, um, which is required as, as part of the discipline of that sport or talking about the art that comes out of that. Anyone else? Yeah, I think I think um, it's just making sure that we make space and maybe the word creativity is a better way to make space for people who wouldn't consider what they were doing to be art. Um, so it allows them to e express or, or tell their narrative. I mean, I, 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 I'm very aware that the narratives and the stories that I, I use to reproduce um, uh, through art are mainly men, um, mainly the stories of um, men going to watch men uh, who then read newspapers where the sports journalists are men. And I think sometimes we um, we don't see we don't see that it just seems to be accepted as uh, the norm. So it's great to to make a space for people that can move in to um, and 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 just produce work um, that we can talk about and that we can see. So I think it's about visibility, and I think creativity is a good word, a good accessible word to use. Thanks, Gail. I'm going to move to Fran's question. Um, Fran says, in addition to evoking emotion, I'd be interested to know what the panel think the role art has in recording and interpreting sporting moments, thinking about social and wider history. That's, that sounds like it's a long burn question, <laughs> this one. <laughs> I was going to ask something similar, actually, of, of Gail, because I'm really interested in how what you're looking at is quite obviously a difficult subject area that people might find it hard to talk about and how perhaps art is a way into speaking about some of the um, more negative sides of sport and, and sporting moments that have, that have happened. Um, do you see what you do as a way into encouraging people to talk about difficult subjects within sport? For example, could we talk about hooliganism in football through through art and discussing art and contributing to art and, and collecting people's memories in the way that you have for this artwork? I think that links to the question. I'm not entirely sure it does, but... Yeah, uh, I think it allows... Um... Uh, yeah, I think for, for me, I was quite surprised um, uh, uh, and felt that I was quite thoughtless that sometimes people write to me or talk to me and they start crying. And these are people, um, you know, the, the, the crash happened, uh, I think th this week, it, it will be the 64th anniversary, and people are still getting really, really upset when they talk about it. Um, and that was quite shocking for me and I think we I didn't I didn't realize that um it would evoke that kind of memory and then if you if you draw something and give it back to somebody you've reinterpreted their narrative and and it evokes that sort of um 
anxiety and upset, you then feel very guilty. Um, so I think there does need to be things in place um, uh, around that so people are supported. Um, uh, e even just like re recent um, uh, events, um, Hillsborough particularly, you know, they've got a, a really good support network uh, around them. And I think those models can be used to help people on a wider context around grief, particularly in the times of COVID, um, uh, particularly the, the projects that are happening and sporting memories with um, people with uh, dementia. Um, so I, I think it's a, 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 a bottomless pit of possibilities um, sport and art because it brings people together thanks both oh sally i i think the sport is so tied up in in emotion and it's not just grief but there's love there and joy and these are things that people want to memorialize and whether that's painting a moment in time so like a celebrate you know, if it was an event that um, you have a close personal relationship like for example 1966 um, the world cup or a horse race or winning the, your horses run the grand national this is so much tied up in joy and emotion love of the team love of your horse whatever and it's one of the way that art can capture those specific moments and maintain it and I think that's more and even that goes within this what Imogen was saying about one of the things that people are asking for from the National Museum of Scotland is those celebrations of celebrity sportsmen who have achieved something specific and it's just capturing a moment in time and capturing that joy and that love, whether it's the love of the celebrity, the moment or the event, they're all tied up and that's what sport brings and to a certain extent what art can capture. Thanks Sally. I think we're going to open up to the Q&A now. We've got two additional questions from Helen and Lucy in the chat, so I just wondered whether they could be the starting questions potentially the ending questions, because we're almost coming up for 25 past 11 now. Um, so, Helen, are you okay to ask your question to the panel? Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hello there. Can you um, thanks. Uh, my question, and it's not, well, mainly for Sally actually but um but I would you know it, it can be widened out but I was thinking about the nature of racing and equestrian equestrian sports in general which I I am a fan of and um but I would describe them as as quote conservative sports and I wondered if Sally had any thoughts around whether that kind of the nature of the sport uh, has a reflect, you know, is reflected in the nature of the art produced. And, and this is outside of the realms of historical commission. Obviously you own a champion racehorse and, you know, you want it depicted in that sort of certain style. But I wondered if, if, if. Very, mu very much so. And you touch on a, a, a very significant thing that has happened is that there's been a schism between uh, traditional sporting art, as was depicted, which still is a, a genre of sport and is still represented. It, it, it's that typical uh, portrait painting, the realistic portrait painting. Mm. And, uh, and where it is being depicted in the rest of the art movement. And it, it, it is a schism that's happened and it's probably has its roots in futurism, uh, Country pursuits and horse racing um, were part of the rural little and the rural uh, countryside. And when you uh, got uh, with the coming up to the world, second world, first world war, you had this reaction and the development of the modernist movement. And particularly in this country, there was an absolute 
attack against the traditional. Uh, and I think it was probably exemplified by um, uh, the vortices with blasting. They blasted sport as an, uh, it, within their manifesto, uh, with the exception of boxing. And it became sort of, sort of slightly unacceptable for the modernists to depict sport. It became mm. a bit of a taboo. So you had two different art movements and they have continued to work within this country. So you still got the traditional sporting artists working who will be doing the Hawks portraits. And an, an excellent example of that is somebody like Charlie Church. There's mm. also Ripley who works as well and are being still being commissioned and are very popular within the racing community because they'll always be part of that racing community will still want to memorialize their sport and they do it in a traditional way because what's important to that racing community is that you have a realistic portrait of your horse that is what I was touching on previously um, that will give you the memory of that going forwards which you can't get in a photograph and I think probably that's all I want to say on 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 that subject. They so they have diverse, and I don't think they've come together yet. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Sally. Um, coming up for eleven twenty eight. So I'm going to go to Lucy um, to ask her question, and then I'm going to hand hand over to Fran for the closing remarks. Lucy. Oh, hello. Um, hope you can hear me. Yeah. Yep, okay. Um, yeah, so, um, well, not really sure it was a question really, but um, I suppose I'm interested in swimming. And I guess I was thinking a bit about how um, sort of um, nakedness in art, you know, kind of like particularly like the female nude has been quite a traditional subject, but obviously within a sporting context, um, uh, that sort of nakedness or semi-nakedness that you would get in swimming um, or water sports, um, you know, would focus more on kind of physicality and strengths and things like that. And I, I, I suppose I don't really have a, a, a particular question, but I was just sort of thinking if that's an interesting kind of sort of way of, or sort of way of thinking about sort of different types of depictions of bodies, I suppose, you know, with the sporting angle and the much more kind of perhaps a sort of, you know, emphasis on, yeah, strengths and physicality. Anybody want to come in? Um, Lucy, I'm just going to put in the chat. There's a wonderful Japanese print called Diving, which shows a woman diving, dated about 1932 by Onchi Koshiro. Um, I'll just put that in the chat so I can't get the image up. But um, oops, I mean, I'm messaging <laughs> Fran, um, everybody. Um, anybody want to come in to add or comment on? I think the, the body beautiful has always been an inspiration for art and sportsmen have always been an uh, the sportsman's body has always been an inspiration. You only have to look at the Greek statues of wrestlers uh, to to see that. And I think if you have a look at the, the work that came out to the uh, road to 2012 that were commissioned by the MPG, there is some amazing pictures of Paralympians Paralympians and Olympians just showing the beauty of their body uh, and I think that's something that's always been an inspiration for artists uh, and the same with if you go back to horse racing the the stubs and the beauty of the uh, horse is also part of that sort of school but mm -hmm. the, the beauty of the human body has always been something that has been an important part of sporting art and still is. Absolutely. And then when you think about swimming and then you move on to bathing, I mean, multiple scenes of bathing in art um, and, and how far does that move into the sort of sporting arena, I suppose. I suppose it's the same because the bodies are on show, but um, I it's just gone half past now. I think I am duty bound to hand back to Fran so that we don't overrun too much. But everybody, thank you. Thanks for all your engagement. Thanks for all your sharing and look forward to what's coming up in the month of February for Sport in Art. Thanks again. Thanks, Imogen. And I'd like to echo what Imogen's just said. So thank you, everybody, for um, your participation today. I particularly like to thank Imogen, who's been a, a fantastic chair for our session and to thank our speakers, Sally, Tilly, Belinda and Gail.
Um, I'll um, send all the links that have been shared in the chat today. Um, this session has been recorded, so I will send around the link to recording once I've done a little bit of light editing. Our next event um, is a draw along with our um, in-house illustrator, Jess Hartshorn, and it's on um, the 11th, February the 11th. So if you want to come and try your hand at a bit of practical art and talk about how you can use art um, as part of your programming, whether that's part of learning or how you link with your displays, um, Jess has been very experienced and worked with um, many, many um, organisations, and I'll put the link in the chat. So that just, um, I'll, as we're on time, that just leaves me to say uh, thank you to everybody, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you.